opportunity to be with you today and to share some of my story and the story of Dunkin' Donuts and what is now Dunkin' Brands, including uh, Baskin Robbins and uh, Togo's. Embedded in my remarks will be some personal issues as well as some corporate issues, some themes, challenges, mistakes, and learnings along the way to hopefully help you on your journey. And I'll start by saying with how Jim concluded that if I'm able to inspire one or two of you or help a couple of you avoid some of the mistakes that I made, I'll consider my impact to be significant. I, uh, I grew up in Hanover, Pennsylvania, a town of about 15,000 people in rural South Central PA, about six miles north of the Mason-Dixon line, so I consider myself almost a southerner. Now, my sisters were both very good students. They were all A students, and I was expected to be a good student as well. But I was more focused on athletics, especially football. And I grew up with uh, a rebellious streak. It was important for me to be the toughest kid on the team and really overcome any perceptions that kids might have that I was soft because my parents belonged to the local country club. And I rejected that club and its genteel sports of golf and, and tennis for uh, football, basketball, track, and even a little boxing. And while the competitive drive would most of the time serve me well, except in some relationships, uh, the rebellious side would sometimes work against me. But nonetheless, I worked hard in school, on the athletic fields, and jobs while I captained the high school football, basketball, and track teams, and really didn't experience much in the way of personal failure until I got my rejection notice from Dartmouth, an Ivy League school where I had been recruited to play football. Uh, I wound up going to Colgate, which was a distant second, and if you know in upstate New York where that uh, is, you'll understand why that was maybe a distant second. But at Colgate, um, I consistently made dean's list. I played lacrosse, but I really excelled at poker, bridge, and learning how to drink to excess. I had the opportunity to graduate with uh, honors, but opted to party on Cape Cod with my fraternity brothers versus taking the honors exam, and I guess that was just another example of that rebellious streak in me. Uh, after graduation from Colgate, I married my high school sweetheart, my first wife, and went straight to graduate business school at the University of Virginia. I really had no clue that I wanted to get into business, but I knew that I didn't want to die in Vietnam and college and graduate school were the means of deferring the military obligation. Uh, and in my summer between my two years in business school, I interned at a relatively young 17-year-old company called Dunkin' Donuts. And Dunkin' would subsequently go public the following year in 1968. Well, after graduating from Darden in 1968, the war wasn't over, so I delayed as much as I could. I did another 120-day uh, delayed enlistment into the Army, went to basic training AIT and Infantry Officer Candidate School, where I graduated in the top of my class, which allowed me to get out of the infantry and into the adjutant general or administrative branch where I became the personnel psychologist at the induction center in Baltimore, 40 miles from where I grew up. So after my three-year military career and a short stint traveling across country in a Volkswagen bus, uh, I mean, hey, it was the 1970s. So uh, I spent a little time in the San Francisco Bay Area and then got back in touch with Dunkin' Donuts and started my career in January of, of 1972. And just to give you an idea of the uh, scale, when I joined the company in 1972, we had about 500 shops. Our sales were roughly 90 million. And when I retired 31 years later, our sales were in excess of 4 billion. We had more than 10,000 locations across three brands in 60 countries throughout the world. Now, I started my career as a district manager. What uh, attracted me to the opportunity to be a district manager was it was really a consulting position to franchisees, guiding them in the areas of production, sales, 
finance, accounting, real estate, even legal areas. Uh, so that was appealing to me. And at the time I joined the company, it was transitioning in its culture from the entrepreneurial culture of its founder, Bill Rosenberg, to a more professionally managed culture uh, with the founder's son, Bob Rosenberg, who was a Harvard, uh, recent Harvard MBA graduate at the helm of the company. I worked hard and uh, earned the trust and respect of my peers and franchisees and supervisors, and hence this acronym which you see on the screen, NWOL. Does anyone know what that might stand for? It stands for Not Without Labor. And uh, that, <coughs> excuse me, became my mantra in the way that I signed most of my communication when, there, when we did actually write letters to our sons or even signing uh, an email, NWOL, not without labor. And you'll hear me reference that again. And you heard really Jim speak about the importance of working hard and nothing without working hard or nothing without labor. Well, after about 18 months, I was afforded the opportunity for a lateral move from Michigan to New England, which was really the heartland of Dunkin' Donuts, so it meant more money and more exposure for me. But unfortunately, it also meant displacing my wife from a teaching position in East Lansing, Michigan, which she enjoyed immensely. So we transferred to Connecticut, and after a year, she got caught up in the woman's movement and left me for Columbia, South America. So I was actually emotionally devastated and uh, threw myself into my uh, job, uh, earning another promotion to the metro New York area where I was now responsible for six district managers and about 200 stores. In 1978, I was asked to take a lateral transfer to Chicago to address a critical challenge for Dunkin' Donuts. And honestly, if I had known how difficult the situation was, I wouldn't have taken the assignment. Not that I was given a choice, but uh, Nonetheless, I plowed forward, I replaced our entire organization, went to court with our worst franchisees, and after cleaning up our stores, mounted an effective marketing campaign to thwart the competitor. And the learning point here was to shore up the foundation before building out aggressively. And uh, the next move then was a company uh, reorganization in 1979 uh, my boss, who had been the vice president of operations, got promoted to what I called one of the three feudal lords. There was the uh, senior vice president of development, the senior vice president of operations, and the senior vice president of marketing. Well, the good news was I got promoted to a vice president of operations responsible for about 40% of the chain, the mid-Atlantic and the Midwest. The bad news was when I took the lateral transfer from New York to Chicago, I was never replaced in New York. Now I was in the position of vice president and I had four directors reporting to me, two of whom were me. So I really had three jobs. I had the vice president supervisory role, I had the old job that I had in New York and the job in Chicago. And at that point in time in my life, it was very, very hectic. You know, 80, 90 hour weeks were not uh, uncommon. And again, the not without labor principle really came into full play there. 